I guess I'm asking you to, to do a major refocus. Uh, the previous lecture was overwhelming, thank you, Joe, uh, in, in terms of categories uh, and a philosophical view of history. In a certain sense, as I talk about spirituality, I'll be using different categories to describe it, as I did yesterday. And it will be interesting in the Q&A how we can bring <laughs> these two kinds of discourse together. So I'm asking you to make a, a somewhat of a change in your thinking so that you can hear what I'm saying about spirituality. Um, yesterday, just to recap for a second, I talked about uh, my experience as a kid of uh, being in a school that basically presupposed the Christian worldview. <laughs> and that's the way I thought everyone thought. And uh, to my oh, the only difference was when I got to university, I felt the massive attack of secular humanism. There I discovered that the opponent to Christianity was secular humanism. With its conviction, much of what Joe was saying today uh, as the way of closing down the Christian discourse. But then I told you when I came to the States and studied theology, I was asked to study the death of God theology and how we all thought that that was the sign that secular humanism had won. God was no longer alive and we can get on with being secular humanists. But I mentioned that there was one professor in this death of God theology that made an astonishing statement with the title of his book, David Miller, uh, The New Polytheism, 1974. I was studying this around 1968. So it was very close to that time where he said, at the death of God, we shall see the rebirth of the gods and goddesses of ancient Greece and Rome. So it wasn't, the death of God was not the end of spirituality. It was the end of the spirituality focused on the God of Scripture. But other gods could be brought in to take God's place, the gods and goddesses of ancient Greece and Rome. And as he was saying that, I was also noticing the spread of what's called New Age spirituality, where people were discovering a sort of freedom in spirituality to discover who they are in terms of themselves as divine. And they discovered that through what was happening also at the time, the Hinduization of the West or the Easternization of the West. But New Age was very much a, a, a personal goal for personal spiritual liberation. It had no real larger pretensions. But then I discovered, so what you're getting from me is a sort of a history of my experience of the so-called Christian West. Then I discovered the transformation of the New Age into a worldview and how that worldview has come to be called post-secularism. There was a determination to take the focus off the self and to actually build a worldview based on pagan spirituality. And I guess... I feel my role in this wonderful debate is to remind you that having heard these great lectures on the kingdom of God, to just remind you that the struggle is becoming more intense because we have now people committed to the promotion of the kingdom of Satan, full of power, full of a conviction that this is their time. 
And so as we think about the kingdom of God, which is what we absolutely have to do, we must realize the context in which now we are to speak about the kingdom of God. It's a new time of attack on biblical faith. And uh, I came to that point where I reached post-secularism as this high point in this new spirituality. And my next uh, subject was the coming cosmological synthesis. In other words, the building of a pagan ontology requires a notion of bringing everything together. Oneism tends to want to do that, to unify everything. And I saw the power of this particular movement in 2000, when I attended a conference in Berkeley. My son went there, and he called it Berserkly, but... Uh, <laughs> And I paid my money and went to this conference entitled Transforming Worldviews for the Planetary Era. And there, there were 400 pagan intellectuals. And I went there, not as a pagan intellectual, but because I was, I was intrigued by the very notion that intellectuals could talk about worldview, granted what? Postmodernism had said that there was no longer any uh, worldview, no longer any mega story to which we could make an appeal. So here these intellectuals were studying the transformation of worldview for the planetary era. What kind of a meta narrative were they proposing? My breath was taken away by the full-scale nature and enormous potential of this offensive against the biblical worldview. And I think that means that for Christian witness, this is not business as usual, that we have to be as sharp as we can, and I've been hearing this theme during these last few days and so glad to hear it, that we have to understand not simply our own theology, but the ideology of the world around us. That's why we're interested in culture. We're interested in culture to understand it so that we can better preach the gospel to it. Not close our minds and say we don't want to know any of that awful stuff. We need to study the culture and what it's saying. One of the speakers at this conference was a certain Richard Tarnas, T-A-R-N-A-S. He's one of the most amazing people, and I would suggest you all eventually try to read his book, The Passion of the Western Mind. Richard Tarnas, The Passion of the Western Mind. By the way, I did send in a bibliography to uh, Lauren. Did it ever get printed, and will it ever get in the hands of the students? Yes. It will. Okay. So uh, you can find the details of some of these books in the bibliography I sent over. The Passion of the Western Mind is the title of this book, and this is a, an integral understanding of the whole of Western history from a pagan perspective. Rarely do you find books like this, and he's a brilliant writer. He manipulates the English language the way Willem does, uh, with great skill. And uh, it's amazing to, to read his prose. So he's a brilliant writer and is very readable. But he's essentially trying to totally overturn any influence of the Christian faith in the West and fill it with a pagan view of existence. He um, studied psychotherapy with Stanislav Grof, 
And uh, Stanislav Grof, as you remember, was the inheritor of Carl Jung in the West. He studied with Joseph Campbell, who was the great author of mythology. He studied with Houston Smith, who was the, uh, a mission kid whose parents went to the East as missionaries, and he became a Buddhist. So that kid went the wrong way, but he became uh, an expert in Eastern religions. And Tanis became a brilliant expositor of the new paganism. The Passion of the Western Mind is 550 pages. It was published in 1995. And he argues that the future of the planet now hangs in the balance. I'll quote him. The collective psyche seems to be in the grip of a powerful archetypal dynamic in which the long alienated modern mind is breaking through out of the contractions of its birth process, out of what Blake called its mind-forged monocles, sorry, manacles, <laughs> monocles would have been okay there, I guess, mind-forged manacles to rediscover its intimate relationship with nature and the larger cosmos. In other words, the mind has been limited, and in particular limited in terms of secular humanism. And the mind needs to be broken open to receive all the information that we can get. In order that intelligent thinkers become aware of the spirit world based on ancient myths or archetypes, the forged manacles indeed referred to secular humanism's power over the mind, causing secular humanists to reject this kind of spirituality as totally primitive. That's what happened for many years, and the secular humanists would not consider this kind of spirituality, which now they are buying into and don't find it any more primitive. So he calls for an intimate relationship with nature and the larger cosmos by the mediation of spirits. You probably know a few people that have been tempted by that kind of an approach these days. I keep meeting people who come to me and tell me that that's what happened to their brother or sister or their parents, and they've just gone off the, uh, the map in terms of any kind of Christian commitment. So Tarnas seeks to give an all-embracing account of human history. And the goal of these 550 pages is to rediscover pantheism as the ultimate meaning of Western intellectual history. <laughs> According to Houston Smith, who is considered one of the great uh, theorists of religions, we need to discover the sense of ultimate belonging, not just as a psychological resource, but as a metaphysical birthright, which has been obscured from view. And Parnas, Tarnas wants us to become aware of an inner intelligence not imagined by us, but essential to the whole reality of existence of which we are a special part. He surveys what the Western mind beginning with the ancient Greeks and going right through the classical period, the medieval period, the Renaissance, the, the scientific revolution, and now the postmodern era. He describes the earliest stage of human history as seeing the cosmic creation force as female, but beginning in the 6th century BC, 
He says, you have a rejection of myth and the development of rational analysis, and the Western mind is born, giving rise to a number of revolutions, including the Copernican Revolution in the 16th century, which explodes the myth of man at the center of the universe, producing a cosmological estrangement of modern consciousness. Humans became more and more autonomous, and everything was relative. He also argues, and we seem to be coming face to face with this theme now today, that the Western mind is really a history of men, <laughs> no Deborahs. From Socrates and Aristotle to Copernicus and Darwin, it's the ascent of man. Man struggle with nature. So the rational mind is represented by Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Paul, Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Copernicus, Galileo, and I keep going, but no ladies. But, of course, he believes that we're reaching a stage where female wisdom is now available. as we learn to honor nature and use pagan rituals of the old religion that worshiped the goddess. Feminine archetypal principles, such as the sacredness of the physical body, the sexual instincts, and the animal kingdom that are traditionally represented them were judged more and more severe, as was the entire female race. But now we've learned that that was false. So he says the crisis of, of the modern time is the crisis of a masculine nature. The resolution of the crisis must be the empowerment and resurgence of both the feminine, or not, no, must be the resurgence of the feminine and feminine values in both men and women. So the great synthesis then becomes the discovery of pagan spirituality focused on the worship of the goddess and the importance of the woman, but then a synthesis now with all the rest of history represented by males. But the great synthesis of which he speaks is the post-secular religious mind. Tana sees the contribution of postmodernism, pluralism, complexity, and ambigu ambiguity as the characteristic ne characteristics necessary for the potential emergence of a fundamentally new form of intellectual vision. He describes this vision this way. Various still vital forms of the modern sensibility of the scientific mind the widespread urge to reconnect with the body, the emotions, the unconscious, the imagination and intuition, the growing recognition of an imminent intelligence in nature, in the broad popularity of the Gaia hypothesis, increasing appreciation of the indigenous and archaic cultural perspectives, such as the Native American, in the new awareness of the feminine perspectives of the divine, the contemporary reemergence of goddess spirituality. This, then, is the synthesis, you see, bringing all these elements now to bear on our minds of the 21st century. So human history is culminating in the great synthesis of the two tendencies of, the, of Western history, the autonomous mind of scientism and the wild spirit of the romantics. This is the synthesis. This is the essence, if you like, of the post-secular age, the joining of science and romanticism. This theory of history is clearly tendentious, seen in the total absence of any serious engagement with vast philosophical and cultural influences of biblical theism in European history. For Tarnas, theism as a powerful force 
that's Christianity, peters out during the 18th century, overcome by Enlightenment secularism, and from then on is no longer a significant factor. So you don't have to worry anymore about theism. Now, I'll be talking in my second lecture today about the two options. I believe the only ones available, uh, what I call oneism or twoism, and twoism is biblical theism. And those are the only two options that face human beings uh, from a theological point of view. But that construction of history is totally uh, fails to take into account that other possible way of understanding existence. So it is a tendentious story. It's interesting the way he describes the way the Western mind is developing. The deepest passion of the Western mind has been to reunite with the ground of its being, namely Mother Nature. So the passion of the Western mind reaches its culmination when rational thinking is joined to spirituality. The final joining of the Western mind with its Western animistic spirit is the essence of post-secular spirituality. It constitutes the ultimate union of the rational with the mythical, the normal with the paranormal, the material with the immaterial, the human with the divine. Here's the synthesis. And it is an attractive synthesis, I'm sure, for many people. In spite of the tendentious nature of this history, Tarnas has seduced many people. Joseph Campbell, the guru to George Lucas, who inspired the Star Wars trilogy, calls uh, Tarnas the most lucid and concise presentation of history I have ever read. The CEO of Apple Computer, John Scully, states that Tarnas's work is powerful and will serve us well into the next millennium. So Tarnas is making an impact on our modern representatives of uh, the world with positions of importance. And uh, I think we have to take this man seriously. But he's just one example of what we're calling the post-secular era. I think what we also need to include is the coming together in this era of both pantheism and secular atheism. The charge that pantheism is atheistic is as old as pantheism itself. Uh, Karl Marx said that the pantheistic God is explicitly not other than us, not an alien force. We do not tremble, Marx says, before this new God or even confront it. We are it. So some of these secular humanists maintain a certain spirituality for the self as being expressions of the old pantheism. Mitchell Silva, who teaches philosophy at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, in his book, A Plausible God, Secular Reflections on Liberal Jewish Theology in 2006, analyzes what he calls the new God of contemporary Judaism, which is sort of a new age approach to Judaism, expressed in the writings of people like Michael Lerner, Arthur Green, and Mordecai Kaplan. Uh, 
this new God is the God within of mystical Kabbalistic pantheism. Silva's conclusion, and he is, as I said, an atheistic Jewish philosopher teaching in America. His conclusion is very interesting, especially the way he says it. When the Messiah arrives, or after the revolution, there will be those singing God's praises, God with a small g, and others whistling a secular song, and neither needs to be out of tune. What he's doing is really predicting that secularism and this pantheistic spirituality will enter into the synthesis. And so we will have all the powerful minds, not all of them, but many of the powerful minds in our Western culture seduced by this new spirituality. And that's the reason why I think we have to take it very seriously. Because Silva argues that there is no significant difference in these two systems, secular atheism or modern-day and ancient pantheism. The secular atheists and the new God believers are two groups of moderns who accept the same literal description of reality. And what is that? Well, it's a description that there's nothing outside of ourselves. There is no transcendence. There is no creator. And when you have such a fundamental belief about the nature of the divine, there's no reason why these two groups can't come together because they fundamentally agree. The new goddess, as he calls the spiritualists of this new Jewish spirituality, believe that the essential work of religion is this worldly and share with moderns the notion of freedom which flows from the rejection of the supernatural. So both pantheism and atheism hold this high element of freedom from any kind of imposing divine force or person. So the real difference between atheists and pantheists have only finally to do with vocabulary and emotional speech, but in essence they are the same. They can join together in a common social vision of a shared, shared notion of freedom. And it's interesting, when you look at some of our modern secular humanists and atheists, you begin to see a, a, a note of spirituality that emerges. Daniel Dennett, Dennett, a prime mover in American atheism, agrees with uh, Silva. The time has come to embark upon a forthright scientific, no holds barred investigation of religion as one natural phenomenon among many. So here's a secular humanist that is opening himself up to this kind of spirituality. Because this, of course, won't shake really his atheism. It's just another aspect of who we are as human beings. Richard Dawkins, author of The God Illusion, calls pantheism sexed up atheism. These men understand quite clearly what this new spirituality is all about. It is essentially a form of atheism. He said in an interview on BBC Radio, and I heard it because I was awake listening to it in the middle of the night, that he is in favor of mystical spirituality. So the author of The God Delusion is in favor of mystical spirituality. Stephen Hawking identified God with the laws of nature. Sam Harris, one of the popular atheists du jour, who wrote in his book The End of Faith, excoriates organized religion as dangerous and absurd, but also says, we need a positive statement of spiritual experience, though without any endorsements of divisive superstitions. So he also is in favor 
of this new kind of spirituality to be added to his uh, uh, plateau of options. So I do think that we, as we can talk now about post-secularism and what it involves in terms of what Thomas calls the new synthesis, it's the synthesis of scientific atheism and new age pantheism. And those two forces are destined to come together. And that will be, I believe, the powerful opposition to the Christian faith in the days ahead. And so I have a, a little section here called The West Converts to Paganism. I've tried to go through looking at the process, how New Age thinking came in, secular humanism as an independent position was fundamentally weakened by this whole new notion of pantheistic spirituality. And the real story of the 60s, then, is a religious story, a story of the conversion of the West to a religious belief system. I was intrigued discovering a number of years back a book published in 1995 by a Roman Catholic scholar entitled When God Becomes Goddess, The Transformation of American Religion. And we were assured by this Roman Catholic theologian, whose name is Richard Grigg, that religion in America would not disappear. It was simply in the process of transformation. He naively observes Significant elements of traditional religion, belief, and practice are passing away, but a new kind of religiosity is poised to take its place. Religion in America is healthy. It's just that religion is changing religions. That's what I saw when I came back to the States and went through that culture shock in 91, suddenly realizing that this once Christian nation was changing religion and converting to a totally different other kind of religion. And this, I believe, is what Tarnas has shown. His overview of history speaks of the contemporary triumph of early Christianity as a conversion of the pagan mind now the opposite has occurred. The passion of the Western mind, thanks to Mother Nature, has converted the Christian mind. From the 60s on, with the empowerment and resurgence of the feminine and feminine values, the West has converted back to paganism, to the worship of the goddess, when God becomes goddess. The Transformation of the American Mind, as that book title said. This can be illustrated by reference to Carl Jung, who for Tarnas is a major figure in contemporary cultural transformation. Since Jung sought to create the world's final, as he says, unitary religion, that was his goal. Let's bring one religion together for the entire world. On what will that be based? Jung's recent biographer, Harvard researcher Richard Knoll, himself not religious, sees Jung as having the same effect on the modern world as the fourth century emperor, Julian the Apostate. You remember Julian was the nephew of Constantine. He was raised as a Christian, but he went back to paganism to worshiping the goddess. And uh, 
this uh, biographer of Jung, Richard Knoll, says, Julian tried to turn the empire back to paganism. The only difference between Julian and Jung is that Jung has succeeded where Julian failed. <laughs> Here's a scholar, a Harvard scholar, who makes that statement that Julian tried to turn the empire back to paganism. He failed. Jung has succeeded. Now that that conversion has occurred, the next step is the taking of cultural power by applying fundamental religious commitments of paganism to all areas of life. I think we have seen the change of a marginal cult into a master plan. The uh, marginal New Age spirituality is now expanding to be a master plan. This New Age individualistically focused spirituality and the promise of a non-threatening personal sexual choice have morphed into a rationally defended post-secular religious pagan worldview or master plan. And uh, you can read some of the folks who've been working on this project. June Singer, for instance, who was a Jungian psychologist and also made herself an expert in the Gnostic texts, proposed in 1974, I think it was, <clears throat> a new form of sexuality, androgyny. Androgyny would be our new sexual identity that would fit with our new spirituality. And she, in that book, she exhorted her fellow pagans to, quote, build their own cosmology based on the joining of the opposites and on their own choice of gods. A cosmology based on the joining of the opposites. Doesn't that make you wonder why we are in a period now, just a, a generation later, which is rejecting the binary and proposing the non-binary as the way forward. The joining of the opposites, <clears throat> conjunctio oppositorum, as the ancient pagans said, the joining of the opposites is a fundamental plank in the pagan worldview. Everything must be joined together, and I'll show that uh, this afternoon on my uh, slideshow, which... I think you'll enjoy as I try to give you a more visual picture of this spiritual option. But um, the joining of the opposites, you see, this woman, a brilliant woman, by the way, claims is the essence of the new cosmology that she was seeking to provoke to be developed in the 70s of the last century. I think the work is well near completion. The late Thomas Berry, one of the seminal architects of this new planetary civilization, called for a new pattern of human presence on the planet, what he called our great work. The great work, our future, our way into the future, 1991, he wrote that. As you can see, crucial to this worldview this new cosmology is sexuality, and I want to develop that tomorrow. So I don't want to sort of try to get into it now because I don't have enough time. But I'm sure you are reeling under the power of the reinterpretation of sexuality in the last few years. Where does all this come from? <laughs> it, it, it's quite amazing that this is happening, but it's happening because just a handful of people have decided 
to develop cosmology based on these notions. And it is quite shocking. Some of you know, and I saw it yesterday, that the focus of the GB, what is it, LGBTQ uh, ideology is absolutely everywhere. And yesterday or the day before, it was discovered that the Reformation wall in Geneva with the statutes, have you ever been to Geneva and seen the statutes of Calvin and Beza and uh, Knox? And who's the last one? Um, Farrell, 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 uh, have been covered in the colors of the rainbow, paint all over them. Two days ago. And you, you, you should look it up on, uh, on uh, your social media because I, I just think it's a shocking indication of where this ideology wants to go. It wants to go to the heart of the Christian faith. That's why I make no, uh, I, I make no apology for focusing tomorrow on sexuality as the driving element in the building of this new pagan cosmology. It's not as sophisticated as Joe's in terms of, in terms of uh, philosophy, but I think we could have a good old time with the Q&A trying to fit what I see with what Joe is analyzing, which is absolutely brilliant. But um, I, I do see that we are in the process of the fulfillment of this goal that was stated in the 70s uh, to create a new cosmology. And we will see that especially taking place in sexuality. I come to the end of this with uh, simply referring you to a book that I mentioned the other day. And I, I do so with pleasure because this man seems to, without ever citing me and probably never will, uh, reaffirming what I've been trying to develop myself uh, in my own little way. Stephen Smith distinguished professor of law at San Diego University, published a book last year entitled Pagans and Christians in the City, Culture Wars from the Tiber to the Potomac. And uh, somehow we got to fit this with Joe's analysis uh, because what he sees is the study of two kinds of religion. And he argues that they've always been around. We've forgotten one of them, or we're undermining one of them, but they're the only two religions, which is what I've been saying for 20 years. But it's nice to see an academic of his caliber say the same thing. He argues that we have today a progressive view of history which sees everything as moving forward from one phase to another, leaving past phases irretrievably behind, believing that there is no going back to earlier stages as the way history unfolds. So there is always a wrong side of history as we move forward in a one-directional way from primitive times to modern times, from the Enlightenment to the Age of Reason from secular scientific worldview to eventually post-secular synthetic neo-Marxism. He sees this as the rediscovery of ancient Roman religion, which believes that the divine is part of nature. The other religion, he says, affirms a God who is external to creation. And that religion doesn't change. It develops, okay, but it, it has its fundamental notions that give to human history all the definitions that we need to be human beings. He lays this out in such a careful way that it is well worth your time looking at it. Two kinds of religions. Thus, 
our situation has never changed. He argues that the pagan gods were actors within the world. The God of Judaism and Christianity is, by contrast, the creator of the world who dwells beyond space and time. Pagan religion locates the sacred within Christianity, an imminent sacred. Judaism and Christianity reflect a transcendent religiosity. The sacred is ultimately outside the world. This, I believe, is the great conflict uh, in which we are engaged as uh, the pagans invent their new cosmology and base it upon ancient pagan notions of the divine. And I think it's a challenge to us to bring our understanding of history and the divine to bear in our witness to the Christian faith. And as I've been hearing it said, and I appreciate it, it is essentially the rediscovery of God the Creator who eventually becomes the Redeemer. That's the gospel. It's not the gospel that Jesus died on the cross. It's the gospel that God the Creator became the Redeemer, took on human form and died on the cross. And that's the power of the gospel. But you see, the God of the Bible is a totally different God from the gods of paganism. And we need to be able to show that, make it clear that there are only two options and that even these people who think they're extremely intelligent have chosen one of two possibilities. And that one doesn't make much sense as far as I'm concerned. All right. So tomorrow I will do you my lecture on sexuality. It's a fascinating subject and deserves a whole lecture on its own. Uh, so that's what I want to do for today. Have we got time for, for uh, about seven minutes of questions for Peter? So, uh, let's do that. Okay. Thank you for um, thank you for your question uh, for your presentation. My question was, um, you'd mentioned indigenous spirituality and how that's kind of being brought into pagan spirituality. And so I guess my question was, in, in a world that is increasingly trying to focus on reconciliation mm -hmm. and mend some of the, the grievous atrocities that we committed against the indigenous people, how do we do that without allowing indigenous spirituality uh, to kind of gain popularity and power? Uh, how would we find that balance in, in your yeah. opinion? Well, obviously, I think we have to be honest about what we did, which is always what Christianity finally does. It's honest, and it, it admits when it does wrong. At least the right kind of Christianity does that, as Wilberforce, as Joe will show us, made people do. And so we can not right the wrongs, but we can admit where we did wrong. But I think we, not, we, we mustn't forget either the people like Jonathan Edwards and others spent their time seeking to reach these American Indians with the gospel. And a, uh, someone in my wife's lineage. Who's, John Elliott. Huh? John Elliott. John Elliot. He translated the Bible into Algonquin, I think it was. Uh, so that there was a tremendous attempt on the part of some Christians to show love to the American Indians. But, you know, <laughs> the more you study the American Indian traditions, it was scary stuff, especially if you go further down south into South America where you have a similar kind of spirituality. Where you, they just discovered uh, the re remains of, I think it was 100,000 skulls that have been collected together uh, as part of worship. And obviously, they'd been destroying, or killing 100,000 people, celebrating something or other. Uh, and so you have that part of the American Indian spirituality. The other part is, of course, and I will do this tomorrow, to show you to what extent homosexuality was absolutely essential to American Indian spirituality. And so 
you know, you can tend to look at it and say, well, isn't that all nice and cute? And how could we treat those poor people that way? But their own situation was not that happy. But I do hope we could admit where we've done wrong things. Um, so it just seems like a bit of a contradiction in my mind that uh, a secular atheist um, who, in my mind, deny a spiritual reality would have so much in common with pagans. So do you, um, how, does it, how does an atheist agree so much with a pagan? And do pagans have a view of a, a firm belief in a actual supernatural reality? It's not much of a stretch for an atheist to say, you know, I do feel spirituality somehow. Because what he doesn't want to admit is a transcendent God. But an, a spirituality that he dominates and possesses, that is not difficult. And it seems to me that is the essence of the post-secular world, that these secular atheists have discovered that they can afford to do this without losing their integrity, so-called. I don't think it's that much of a jump, in other words, as this uh, silver philosopher shows. He says it himself. He is an atheist, and he buys into the spirituality element. So would you say that atheists are being inconsistent by... Uh, no. Embracing... No, or... if atheism is the rejection of, of, of a transcendent God, that's the key. It's not whether there are feelings of spirituality or the essence of oh, the fact of spirituality. I don't think they would have to deny that. If what they're saying by that is that that spirituality is shared by everybody and it is not the spirituality of the Bible. Interestingly, Sam Harris, his book, yes. Waking Up, uh, one of the most noted atheists right now, his book, Waking Up, reveals that he's, he's a Buddhist and he's been on That's many right. yeah. uh, lengthy quests to, uh, in, in isolation to discover the oneness of all reality behind all things. That's when it, I think that's his latest book. Or at least it was a couple of years ago. Yep. Yeah. Other questions for Peter? Mine's more of a, on a practical level. So with your experience, how, how are these ideas disseminated as we're talking about um, reclaiming culture, kingdom values? If all of these contradictions mm. are seeming to be inherent, how, I guess I'm just lost as to how one or two or 10 whatever people in these positions, how that information gets disseminated to the point where it influences our popular thought. Like in your experience, having seen that yep. happen, because right now my experience is just in this sphere, like postmodernism is my growing right. up, right? But what are they doing? What are they saying? Right. Are they talking to each other? Are they, is, sure. is the enemy just dropping this on them? Like what? You should try and watch television a bit. In other words, Hollywood has been seduced by this kind of spirituality. Oprah Winfrey is a number one promoter of this kind of spirituality. Marianne Williamson is one of the proposed uh, candidates for president representing the Democratic Party. She won't make it, but this is the level in which uh, we are in many ways. And, you know, many people in our world are tempted by spirituality. It's often said that secular humanism left human beings alone in a spiritless world. And, and this kind of approach is reassuring to many people. And so you see it pretty much everywhere in uh, various TV programs and uh, especially the film stars themselves uh, proposing spirituality of various kinds. So that would be my answer, that it is pretty much all over the place at this time. Yes. My question is on 
uh, the idea of only two religions, so monotheism, the biblical uh, true faith, and pantheism. Um, and I think there are other religions that claim to be monotheistic, Baha'i, Mormonism, that are pantheistic in the Absolutely. end. Absolutely. Um, but what do we do with Islam? Do we understand it as just a, a grave <laughs> misunderstanding of the true faith? Or could you speak on that? Well, Joe and I have been working on a statement about Islam. And uh, both of us independently came to a very similar position. That, that Allah, who seems to be separate from creation, thus a twoist God, monotheist God, actually, because he's a singularity, is impersonal. Can you imagine living forever alone and how that relates to any sort of personhood? In fact, Islam cannot handle that. And so there are places in the Quran where it says that Allah creates human beings in order to have human relationships, in order to have personal relationships. And that means then that a fundamental attribute of God is dependent upon human beings. That is a fundamentally oneist idea of God, because God then is part of the world and not transcendent. That's the amazing thing about the Christian gospel. It's the doctrine of the Trinity. Because it gives to us a God who is totally transcendent, totally absent of any need to be part of us and yet is personal in the mystery of the Trinity. That's the only God that is worth worshiping and it's the only God in any of the religions like that. So I, <laughs> I come back to make my statement that there are only two religions and one religion is the worship of the Trinitarian creator and the other religions in a thousand different ways worship the God who is essentially part of nature. 